Thanks for having me here. Uh, like Andy said, I'm going to talk about farm animal welfare laws and kind of a comparison of some of those laws we have across the United States. Um, know most of you through my current role with Livestock Marketing Association, working with your local auction markets. Um, but like Andy said, prior to that, I was with the Kansas Department of Agriculture and focused on animal health, animal welfare, law and policy. Prior to that, I was the word, world's nerdiest law student who cared about nothing except for how do laws affect uh, livestock and the people who produce livestock. So it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, a little bit of Government 101 right uh, to start us off. Most of our animal care, farm animal care laws in particular, are not federal laws. They are state laws. So when somebody asks a question about what are the requirements for care of farm animals, it's going to depend on what state those animals are raised in, correct? Nod, yeah. So this is, as an attorney, this is like my least favorite thing and my favorite thing all wrapped into one. It's my least favorite thing when I have a livestock market owner call me and say, hey, I want to start drug testing my employees. What do I need to do? Because depending on where they are, I may or may not know that individual state law and have to do the research there. Uh, it's my favorite thing when that jerk guy from high school who was too cool for me, like sends me a Facebook message after not talking to me for 15 years and is like, yeah, I've got this employment law issue and, you know, thought since you're an attorney, you'd like help me out for free. And I can be like, sorry, we live in different states. So, you know, so. <laughs> All right, so there are some federal laws in the space. They're limited, but uh, let's get those on the board to start with. Dr. Helms mentioned one, and it was the one that was the beginning of the start of her organization. Does anybody remember what federal law that was? I heard a couple of people say 28-hour law, correct. So animals that are tra transported across state lines, and that's where you get your federal jurisdiction from, um, may not be confined in a vehicle or a vessel for more than 28 continuous hours without being unloading for feed, water, and rest. But that's specific to livestock as they're being transported, right? So we also have a couple specific laws as it relates to the slaughter or processing of livestock. Uh, first of those is going to be the Poultry Products Inspection Act that was passed in 1957. It states that poultry being slaughtered have to be done so using good commercial practices. A year later, we had the uh, Humane Slaughter Act in 1958. This is going to regulate other livestock slaughter besides poultry and it outlines uh, those methods of slaughter that are deemed to be humane and thus appropriate. So we do have some federal laws in the space as it relates to livestock transportation, livestock uh, processing. Um, sometimes people ask about the Animal Welfare Act uh, passed in 1966. This gives the Secretary of Agriculture the authority to create standards that govern humane treatment of animals by dealers, research facilities, and exhibitors. Farm animals are specifically exempted from this law. So we're not going to be talking about the Animal Welfare Act today as we talk about the farm animal welfare component. Um, Horse Protection Act is one that sometimes gets brought up as well. There is a federal law that it makes it a crime to exhibit or transport horses that have been soared. So that takes us to the state level to look at some of the different trends that we have in state law. Um, these are the things I want to touch base on today. I want to talk really briefly about animal cruelty laws. Um, then I'm going to spend some time talking about confinement statutes because that seems to be a trend that we've certainly seen in the last 10 years. Um, there's also some other laws that restrict um, specific production practices that aren't based on confinement or cage space size. Uh, we've seen livestock standard boards starting to get stood up, as Andy mentioned, Ohio being an early adopter of. Um, we also have had some states that have passed laws that prohibit local action, making it clear that this is a state issue and that local municipalities can't have different animal welfare standards as it relates to farm animals. And then I'm not going to spend much time on them, but I think we would be remiss to not at least acknowledge that there's been a lot of conversations over the last few years as it relates to right to farm laws and then also prohibiting undercover filming at farms and ranches. So that's where we're headed. 
Let's start with animal cruelty. All 50 states have some variation of an animal cruelty law. However, in about 30 of those states, they exempt out um, common, normal, standard, customary farm animal practices. So uh, in a lot of cases, as we're talking about farm animal welfare, we're not always talking about the animal cruelty laws in that state because farm animal practices are specifically exempted, as long as they are customary. And that varies from state to state in terms of how that is determined. Um, there's also a difference on who has the authority to investigate animal welfare in different states. And I think that this is something that's interesting that you wanna, might want to pay attention to. Um, the most common model is that it's your local law enforcement that has that authority. Um, but there are also different state models where maybe the state veterinarian has some authority as well, or even um, other veterinarians have the ability to uh, provide insight or um, you know, special knowledge about what are customary practices as it relates to livestock. The piece that I find to be really, really interesting and surprising to a lot of people is that in many cases, um, actually over half the states, your local humane shelters or the officers of members of your local humane shelters have some authority in state laws to investigate as it relates to animal welfare or um, animal abuse. Many of these state laws uh, were created in the 1880s. Many of those local humane shelters or humane societies were really active in the creation of the laws, and so they gave themselves um, some special authorities. And in some cases, it's really broad. Things like the ability to uh, carry firearms or uh, condemn animals. Um, so I think that that's interesting space. It might be something as you are evaluating in your own states the status of your state law, I think it's something to pay attention to. One really good resource for this um, is the National Ag Law Center. I included a link here. They actually have this really cool map on their website where you can click on the states and it'll take you directly to the statutory language of the animal cruelty laws in those individual states. I wanted to start by talking about confinement restriction statutes because that has been a big piece of this conversation over the last decade. Um, there's a lot of different ones, so I thought that maybe we could talk about generally what do these look like, and then we'll just point out a couple specifics in some of the differences. Generally, uh, these laws tend to require that animals can turn around freely, lie down, stand up, fully extend their limbs. Generally, they deal with one or more of three types of animals. Pregnant sows or pregnant gilts, if it's her first litter. Veal calves and poultry, specifically egg-laying hens. Usually they're phased in over a long period of time. You know, the law or the ballot initiative passes in 2005, but we're not going to actually have this be phased in until 2018, something like that. Typically, we're looking at a time frame to uh, phase these sorts of confinement restrictions in. There's also a lot of common exemptions. Uh, one that I'd mention in particular would be uh, for farrowing hogs. Um, those of you who are familiar with the hog industry know that there are very real animal welfare reasons you would want a hog confined when she is having a guilt or when she's having a litter. Um, in that Hogs have a tendency to lay on piglets. Um, so we're going to reduce the number of piglet crushings or the number of piglets lost if we keep that sow confined when she's actually farrowing. So most of these laws have like a seven day exemption for the seven days prior to when she's expected to give birth. Some even go as far as 14 day. Uh, there's commonly an exemption for veterinary care. You can restrain an animal when receiving veterinary care. Animals need to be restrained when being slaughtered or processed, transported, exhibitions, and research. Again, that National Ag Law Center website's a really good resource. They've got another map up where you can click on and find these different confinement statutes in these different states. So how did we get here? Where did these statutes come from? Um, many of them came about by ballot initiative. As a good Kansan, I'm like, well, what's that? Um, 
So this is a map of our states that have a ballot initiative process. And you can see they're mostly western states. Um, and that is, you know, in addition to state legislatures that make laws, that their citizens in those states can vote on a specific policy item and make a law through a ballot initiative. Usually they have to go through a signature gathering campaign, get a certain number of signatures in order to get something on the ballot, and then it's voted on by the public. 2002, Florida was one of our first that we saw here that was a ballot initiative. It was specific to pregnant sows, uh, followed by Arizona. They added in veal calves in addition to pregnant sows with their ballot initiative. Oregon was our first legislative that we saw here, and that was in 2007. 2008 um, in Colorado, that was also legislative, and um, this is going off of the slide, but in addition to hogs, the Colorado also uh, addressed uh, veal calves, and um, it was a legislative attempt, but it was a legislative attempt that was an agreement to avoid a ballot initiative. California is probably one of the best known examples here. Who heard about Proposition 2 in California? Hopefully most people are raising their hands. If they're not, you were kind of under a rock in 2008. Um, California was the first one that added laying hens into the list of animals that were um, protected or had some sort of a confinement um, requirement. Did anybody watch the video, the Yes to Proposition 2 video, where the pigs sang and danced? It's like, it's really catchy. As somebody who, um, you know, was probably not on that side of the issue at the time, it was still really catchy. It gets stuck in your head. Um, it passed. It passed with 63.5% of the vote. Um, and it was really, really expensive. The proponents, the Yes for Proposition 2 campaign, spent $10.6 million dollars on that campaign. The opponents, the Californians for Safe Food, $8.9 million. Ballot initiatives are really, really expensive, folks. Um, another thing I want to mention about California that I find to be interesting is after this successful ballot initiative to require certain things for those animals there in California, they followed that in 2010 by creating a California state law that states that it applies to eggs coming into California from other states. So if you are a poultry or egg producer in another state, but you want to import your eggs into California, you have to abide by the California law in terms of the amount of cage space that those eggs, that those chickens have, those layers have. Um, in 2014, there was an amendment that was uh, part of the House Ag Committee version of the Farm Bill brought forth by Representative Steve King of Iowa, and it was specifically directed at this California issue. This amendment would have, had it been successful, it was not successful, but it would have prohibited states from enacting laws that place conditions on production practices in other states. There was a lot of controversy, a lot of discussion there. Ultimately, that was not part of the 2014 Farm Bill. So in order to sell eggs in California, you do have to abide by those California requirements in terms of cage space for your layers. Keep going with some of these confinement statutes. Um, Maine was a little interesting in 2009. The ones we've talked about previously were criminal statutes. Maine chose to make theirs both a civil and a criminal statute so that a prosecutor had a couple different options, depending on the facts, to prosecute a violation of the law there in Maine. Um, Michigan in 2009 um, had requirements come in for veal calves, pregnant sows, and laying hens. I think it's really interesting to follow the Michigan process and what that bill or proposal started at versus where it ended up. Initially, what Michigan was trying to do was it was trying to codify our um, industry standards, things like beef quality assurance and pork quality assurance as the standards for producing livestock, and it was going to give the Department of Ag the authority to implement these industry-developed standards. Quite a bit different than what that ultimate law ended up looking like, and there was some controversy within the agriculture industry about whether or not the ultimate uh, 
bill was a good thing. There was some you know, controversy even within legislators who had questions about that. Um, Washington State, 2011. We've seen kind of a slowing of some of these things since 2011, and I think a part of that was based on an agreement that was in place between United Egg Producers, UEP, and HSUS between 2011 and 2014. There was a push there for a while to try and get national legislation in this space. Those groups agreed that they were going to seek national legislation that would have doubled space per hen in houses by 2029, required enrichment and also mandated certain sorts of labels on egg cartons about production practices. So as part of this agreement, one of the things UBP asked for is HSUS, please stop funding and pushing some of these ballot initiatives in these different states. And so we saw that really slow down there for a while. Ultimately, this was also really controversial. We had some other um, agriculture groups from other industry sectors saying this might set a precedent that they weren't comfortable with, and therefore it didn't become law. It did not become part of the 2014 Farm Bill. As UEP and HSUS saw that it wasn't successful in that vehicle, that agreement kind of went away. There have been some confinement statutes since then. Rhode Island in 2012, I'd flag for you that in addition to confinement space, they also banned tail docking in that uh, legislation. 2014, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie actually vetoed a bill that would have banned gestation stalls in that state. That was really controversial at the time. He's done more controversial things since then, something about a bridge, I don't know. Um, Massachusetts 2016, that's going to be our most recent. Um, and like California, in addition to setting up those confinement restrictions within the state, it applies it to products that are sold within the state even if the animals were produced out of state. There's also um, the strategy or trend in some places just to simply restrict certain production practices that's similar to what you know, the confinement space is doing, but it's not limited to just confinement. A couple examples. In California, since 2004, uh, foie gras has been banned. You cannot force feed birds more food th than they would naturally eat. Um, in a couple different states, tail docking is banned. Some of those relate to cattle, some of those are specific to horses, but there's 14 different states that in some fashion regulate tail docking, and in some of those cases, it is illegal to do so. Uh, devocalization of dogs is prohibited in five states under certain circumstances. Now you're saying, Chelsea, like, whoa, 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 not a farm animal. Like, I like Skip, um, he's a barn dog, but we're not gonna eat Skip, right? Um, I would argue that we should probably, as livestock industry professionals pay attention to what is happening in the pet space here because there seems to be a trend and some of those groups that are really active in the pet space are also really interested in our farms and ranches and maybe in different ways than we are interested. So I think we should pay attention to what's happening in the pet space. I also think we should pay attention to what happens in California and what some people call the left coast because Things that happen in California in this space and others tend to find their way across the United States in different forms, maybe a couple years down the road. So since I am making the argument we're going to pay attention to pet animals, I do want to talk about one specific pet animal uh, proposition that we had in the state of Missouri. And that is Proposition B in 2011. Uh, it dictated production practices for dog breeders. And the one that I thought was particularly interesting is it limited the number of dogs. You couldn't have more than 50 dogs per kennel. It also uh, required sufficient space to turn around, stretch freely, lie down, fully extend limbs. Does that terminology sound kind of familiar? I thought so too. So that ballot initiative, it was a hard fought fight in Missouri. It passed. 51.6% of the citizens of Missouri that voted on it voted to create these restrictions on dog breeders in Missouri. The state legislature has since gone in and passed a bill that took away that prohibition of a breeder having more than 50 dogs. So the state legislature in a later session changed that piece of it. 
but the proposition did pass. And this is a map of who voted for that proposition. That dark orange are people who voted no. The proposition only won in 12 of the 114 counties in Missouri and the city of St. Louis. That scares me. As I work with um, legislation on the federal level and on the state level, I notice that one of my biggest challenges is not a Republican versus Democrat challenge, it is a rural versus urban challenge. And that's something we're going to continue to have to manage in this space. Andy mentioned uh, animal care and standard boards. I'm not going to dig too deep into the Ohio model because there's a panel that was involved in that model and is involved in that model today that's going to speak to us later today. I'm really excited to hear what they have to say. But broadly, what these animal care and standard boards do is they, through legislation, set up some sort of a board. Typically, it'll involve the state vet, secretary of ag, some other veterinarians, some other farmers, maybe um, local uh, representatives of the public or local humane shelters. And that group is delegated the authority to set standards for different livestock production practices in the state. Ohio was one of the first to do this, 2009. Um, it was actually the legislature who submitted a resolution that was a ballot initiative. That ballot initiative passed by 64%. Ohio has an animal care and standard board. Um, in 2010, they passed some regulations specific to some production practices. Hopefully, they'll talk to us about that process and how they got to those uh, regulations and their experience there. Ohio is not the only one. Here is a list of other states, Ohio included, that have animal care and standard boards. After Ohio created theirs in 2009, there was quite a few bills in 2010, 2011 to create similar boards in 12 to similar boards in other states. Um, not all of these were successful. There were a lot of states that uh, had legislation introduced to create some sort of an animal care and standards board, and those bills did not pass. So these are states that do have boards. There have been other states who have considered this and started to go down this path or thought about going down this path, but did not do so. Andy's tweeting about me. And my watch is telling me so. Um, laws outlining production practices this can be the, very similar to the Care and Standard Boards, or it can be a little bit different. For example, in the state of Virginia, and I believe some others, there are specific requirements, laws, about food and water and when they have to be provided for livestock or other animals as well. Um, Dr. Helms talked about uh, working with Oregon and Washington on setting out standards in statute for egg-laying hens, including standards to meet enrichment standards that are set out by American Humane Association. That's actually codified in law in a couple states. So that's another model. Outlining in the statute, here are some requirements for animal production in this state. New Jersey's kind of an um, interesting case study, and I know that there are people here today that have been more active with this and have more background than I do, and that's probably the case for all states. I should have said that at the beginning. Um, I'm a Kansan. I've spent a lot of time with the Kansas requirements. I know that there are some of you who have been really active in your states with your own state laws, and so I think we could have a good discussion here, if I give us enough time to do so, um, about some of those differences. Um, but I wanted to flag New Jersey, because what New Jersey did is, in 95, they passed a statute that gave the New Jersey Department of Ag the authority, or required them, directed them, to develop standards for the humane raising, keeping, care, treatment, marketing, and sale of domestic livestock. So these regulations were promulgated. It took some time. And when they were promulgated, they at, allowed for routine husbandry practices, which is defined as techniques commonly taught by veterinary schools, land-grant colleges, and agriculture extension agents. They got sued. They were sued saying that that is too broad of a definition, impermissibly broad. They also got sued saying that's unlawful delegation of authority. You're letting those veterinary colleges do the work of the State Department of Ag in determining what is and is not appropriate production practices. Um, there was also some specific practices that the state of New Jersey was allowing 
that were challenged in that lawsuit. Um, the Supreme Court heard it in 2008, the New Jersey Supreme Court, and kind of came out with a split decision. Um, they did say that that definition of routine husbandry practices was too broad and kind of provided some guidance in terms of maybe, you know, referring to specific courses or curriculums or things besides just delegating that authority to veterinary colleges. It did uphold some certain techniques, uh, crating and tethering practices, saying those techniques are science-based, and even though the lawsuit challenged those particular practices, they were upheld. However, uh, tail docking was not upheld in New Jersey. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is that they have had some states that are just prohibiting local action in this space. And the reason they're doing that is because you've got some local municipalities that are getting some great ideas about farm animal welfare and what it should take to raise livestock in Douglas County, North Dakota, um, or even a township level. And so we've had some states who have said, whoa, we need to make sure that we set this aside as a state issue. Um, these statutes tend to clarify that animal care rules are solely a state issue, typically left up to either the Department of Agriculture or an Animal Care Standards Boards. Some examples there of states that pass laws that prohibit the local action, and sometimes you see a hybrid approach. So, for example, Kentucky and Louisiana, in addition to creating Care and Standards Board, they go ahead and prohibit local action at the same time. Some other trends I thought I'd be remiss to not mention um, might not be squarely in this space, but it's related enough that it's probably in the back of some people's mind. One of those is the right to farm laws or constitutional amendments we're seeing. Um, first, this means two totally different things. Right to farm is a term that traditionally was used to describe nuisance laws and nuisance law protection for livestock operations. Those actually exist in all 50 states and essentially provide farmers some protection. If you're a hog farmer and your neighbor, you know, somebody, the city mouse moves next door and all of a sudden they're like, oh, it smells bad, I'm going to sue you. Um, we've got nuisance protection laws for those cases and those are traditionally what we thought of as right to farm laws. Uh, we've got kind of a more recent push for some constitutional amendments in some states or um, that would just affirmatively say in the state constitution, you know, in the state of so-and-so, you have a right to farm, produce livestock, and then there's also a right to hunt, right to fish push that's been happening around the same time in this space. Other thing I wanted to mention in terms of a trend is um, laws relating to the videotaping of opera livestock operations. This is actually not that new. Um, it's been trendy lately, but actually the first law in this space dates back to 1980 in Kansas. In 1991, both Montana and North Dakota passed some variation of prohibitions of videotaping or photo uh, photographing livestock and farm operations. We've seen a surge of states considering this since 2011, although honestly that started to back off um, in the last year or two. The focus varies, and I think that this is interesting. Some of these laws focus on that activity of filming or filming a farm operation. Some of the laws that have chosen to focus on that activity have faced First Amendment challenges as that is a potentially protected activity. Some of the laws have focused on gaining access to the facilities through false pretenses. In other words, if you apply to work on my farm and you fill out a job application, but what you're really trying to do is you're trying to get undercover video, maybe video that you'll splice together and show in some ways that isn't necessarily genuine. It's helping provide some additional protections there. Kind of along those same lines or looking at the same issue, there have been some states that have looked at requiring that abuse be reported within a certain amount of time to a designated authority and requiring that any videotaping of animal abuse be turned over to that authority. So a couple different models that have been thought about in that space.